And welcome back to Coast to Coast. I'm George Norrie. Fast night. Dr. Michael Halleck, a professor of medicine, physiology, biophysics at the Boston University School of Medicine, who has also revolutionized the understanding of vitamin D and its role in disease prevention. He's received the Linus Pauling Institute Prize for Health Research, and here he is on Coast to Coast. Michael, how are you? I'm wonderful. How about yourself? Good, good. You know, I've just been taking over the last couple months vitamin D3. Is that okay, and what is it? Sure. Vitamin D um, is made in your skin from exposure to sunlight, and it's also found naturally in um, salmon, for example, as well as in cod liver oil. And it's very important for bone health and for overall health and well-being. And does it... Now, when, when you talk about vitamin Ds, how many are there? So there are two vitamin Ds. It's called vitamin D3, which is made in your skin. Vitamin D2, which actually comes from um, simulated sunlight exposure to yeast. It turns out that we've done studies recently and showed that vitamin D2 is as effective as vitamin D3 in maintaining both children and adult vitamin D status and works just as well. Now, are you finding it's also starting to fight cancer? There are data to show that if you live at a higher latitude, if you're at higher risk of vitamin D deficiency, you have a more than 50% increased risk of developing colon, prostate, and breast cancer, among other cancers. There were studies done out of Harvard where they showed that in the nurses' health study, that nurses that had the most vitamin D intake reduced their risk of breast cancer by 50%. There's data to suggest that in men that had the highest intake of vitamin D reduced their risk of prostate cancer by 50%, colorectal cancer by 50%, and even leukemia uh, by about 30 to 50%. The Linus Pauling Prize for Health Research, tell me, what was that? What did you do? Well, I was absolutely thrilled and honored um, by that prize because it represents um, to me, um, you know, showing that you can take a very simple concept, which is really vitamin D, and to demonstrate to the world that it has so many health benefits that it can improve their overall health and welfare. And the prize basically recognized my 30 years of research in promoting vitamin D for good health and sensible sun exposure as a major source of vitamin D. So this is pretty darn important stuff, Michael, isn't it? Well, it turns out that, you know, your listeners may be wondering, how is it possible that vitamin D can risk, decrease risk of autoimmune diseases like type 1 diabetes, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, reduced risk of cancers, reduced risk of infectious diseases? The reason is that every tissue and cell in your body has a vitamin D receptor, which means that every tissue and cell in your body needs vitamin D. There's good evidence now that up to one-sixth of the human genome, up to almost 2,000 genes in your body, are directly or indirectly controlled by vitamin D. Have you looked at the vitamin K vitamins as well? Um, I've not done any research in the vitamin K area, but that's also now becoming a very hot topic, and it may have important implications for bone health. I see. Now, doctor, when when they make synthetic vitamins, okay, and they call them pharmaceutical grade, like vitamins A and B and C and D, when they make, how do they make a synthetic vitamin? Yeah, what it, what happens is that if, when you're exposed to sunlight, the precursor of cholesterol in your skin is converted to vitamin D, and so what they do is that they actually collect the precursor of cholesterol from lanolin, from sheep's wool. And then they expose it to ultraviolet radiation, which simulates sunlight, so that you make vitamin D3. So that is considered to be a synthetic form of vitamin D3, but it's identical to what you make in your skin. Or mushrooms or yeast, if they're exposed to simulated sunlight, their precursor of vitamin D is converted to vitamin D2, and like I said, that's what's also considered to be a synthetic vitamin. So are both we get- vitamin D2 and vitamin D3 are used in food supplementation as well as in multivitamin supplements. Are we getting it naturally too? Most humans on this earth have always depended on sun for their vitamin D requirement. 
And that's probably one of the major reasons why vitamin D deficiency has become epidemic in both children and adults in the United States, because everybody now avoids the sun, either because they're working all the time, playing on their computers, or parents are always very concerned about sending their child outside without a sunscreen. We showed that if you put a sunscreen on with an SPF of 30, you reduce your ability to make vitamin D in your skin by 99%. What happens uh, if there's no sunlight for a week or two or there's a lot of rain? Uh, do you still get that yeah, ultraviolet Mother Nature light? has been very clever um, because throughout evolution, humans have always depended on sun for their vitamin D requirement. And it turns out that As people migrated north and south of the equator, they lost their skin pigment, most likely so that they can make enough vitamin D. We also know that if you live above Atlanta, Georgia, you can't make any vitamin D in the winter. So to answer your question, we now recognize that vitamin D being fat soluble, when it's made in your skin or you ingest it in your diet, you store it in your body fat. And at times when it's raining outside or in the wintertime, if you have normal weight, you will actually, as you're using that fat, release the vitamin D back into your body so that your body can have an adequate amount of vitamin D. This turns out, however, to be a problem for obese people because vitamin D sticks in the fat. It can't get back out. And so we know that obese people are at very high risk of vitamin D deficiency And to correct that deficiency, they need two to three times more vitamin D than a normal weighted individual. What led you to uh, investigate vitamin D? Well, you would think that, you know, uh, I was thinking that this was going to be the hottest topic when I first started as a graduate student back uh, in 1969. But it turns out that back then, most people thought vitamin D was probably one of the most boring subjects, right? Down the cod liver oil prevents rickets in children. We don't see rickets anymore, <laughs> right? We're not thinking about vitamin D deficiency. But that happened to be um, the opportunity for me in a laboratory, and it's just like taking uh, a sow's ear and making it into a golden purse. Happened to be in the right place at the right time. We began to realize, working with Dr. Hector DeLuca at the University of Wisconsin, that vitamin D, once it's made in your skin, actually has to go to your liver and then to your kidneys to get doubly activated before it can carry out all its biologic actions in the body. Now, when you investigated vitamin D through the Linus Pauling uh, research, right? Um, The the Linus Pauling Prize was um, in recognition of my 30 years of 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 your work. Of your work. And, and, I mean, 30 years of research. uh, Michael, that's incredible. So... You obviously one of the foremost experts here. Are there other experts for the other vitamins, for like A and B and C? By all means. Yes, there are. Um, there are um, excellent scientists that have spent, you know, basically their entire careers on a particular vitamin. And, and both vitamin A um, as well as vitamin K, you know, have very important health benefits. And a lot of contributions have been made. And, of course, Linus Pauling, had promoted vitamin C. How much do you have to take of vitamin D before it's effective? How many milligrams, for example? Yeah, it turns out that it's, uh, vitamin D is in units, and um, a typical multivitamin contains 400 international units. The, we now recognize that we may be off by a factor of 5 to 10 fold for the total amount of vitamin D that both children and adults need. We showed in um, a study last winter, healthy adults that were taking a multivitamin, taking a glass of milk a day, we gave them 1,000 units of vitamin D a day. Essentially, not one of them was able to become vitamin D sufficient during the wintertime. So we believe that adults need at least 1,500 to 2,000 units of vitamin D a day to satisfy the requirement. For children over the age of one, I recommend at least 1,000 units of vitamin D a day, and up to 2,000 units of vitamin D is perfectly safe. The American Academy of Pediatrics has finally come out with a recommendation that all children from the time they're born throughout their entire childhood should be on at least 400 units of vitamin D a day, and I recommend actually at least two to three times that. 
Did you find animals in the wild, they, they know that their body needs supplements and they go ahead and get it in their sources? Funny you should ask. It turns out <laughs> that, um, th- th- that through the food chain, at least, um, say, in Alaska, um, a lot of the um, animals in the ocean exposed to sunlight make lots of vitamin D. That vitamin D is very plentiful, say, in polar bear liver as well as in steel blubber. And that's why Eskimos never became vitamin D deficient because they take a sliver of polar bear liver or they would take um, and, and eat some um, steel blubber. It turns out that we did a study recently um, with a group in Dallas, uh, Dr. Ferguson's group, looking at lizards. And we put them in a uh, glass tank. We put some lizards on a vitamin D sufficient diet and some lizards on a vitamin D deficient diet. And we gave them light sources, a light source that made vitamin D and a light source that didn't. They looked identical. Those lizards that were vitamin D deficient sought out the light that simulated sunlight so that they can make vitamin D in their skin. So they're actually pretty smart about this. Most animals exposed to sunlight make vitamin D, and that's where they get their vitamin D from, with the exception of cats. Cats cannot make any vitamin D in their skin, and so they absolutely have to get it from their diet. A friend of mine is married to a woman from Japan, and she will not go out in the sun unless she's carrying a little umbrella. And apparently a lot of people from Japan do this. And she wears gloves, and, but she hates the sunlight. And that's not a good thing then, right? Well, it, we've always have depended on sun for our vitamin D requirement. And in fact, skin pigment, like I said, evolved and devolved most likely for the production of vitamin D and for the prevention of damaging effects from excessive exposure to sunlight. That's why most African-Americans in the United States today, even if they're getting a little bit of sun exposure, are vitamin D deficient. Um, It turns out that Asians are at very high risk of vitamin D deficiency because you're right. They avoid all sun exposure. Yeah. And uh, she's from Hiroshima. So they're, uh, you know, they're, they're up, up, uptight about the atmosphere as it is because of, uh, you know, the A-bomb that was dropped there. Yeah, for sure. In I mean, one of, one of the uh, saving features in Japan is that they eat a lot of fish. And fish does provide you with um, a, a natural source of vitamin D. How much sun is too much sun? Yeah, I'm always asked that question, you know. They say, Doc, just tell me, how long should I stay outside? Well, unfortunately... I'm baking, Doc. I'm baking. Right. There you go. It turns out that it depends upon time of day, season of the year, latitude, and your degree of skin pigmentation. Okay, so I'm a white adult. On Cape Cod, if I'm in a bathing suit and I know that I'm going to get a mild sunburn after 30 minutes, I typically recommend to go outside for about five to 10 minutes, expose arms and legs two to three times a week, followed by good sun protection in the spring, summer, and fall. Even though in the summertime, Mm. the sun is shining at eight o'clock in the morning, you're not making any vitamin D in your skin or five o'clock in the afternoon. It's between the hours of 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. that are your best times to make vitamin D. And that's what they also say if you want to get a good suntan, almost between the same time period. And so it turns out that the sun that causes sun tanning is also the same type of sun that makes vitamin D in your skin. Isn't that interesting that we're tied into the sun this way, and probably in more ways than we even know? How does it work that way, Michael? Well, we did some studies, because I was curious about this, um, asking the question, when in evolution did vitamin D make its first appearance on Earth? 